We do, we do. We're going to continue in John chapter 12. Amen. I'm not expecting today's message to get me lots of hallelujahs <laughs> or amens. <laughs> But I believe it's what we need to hear. Um, it's time to eat your vegetables. <laughs> and the meat. <laughs> yeah. The meat of the word that's going to stick to your bones. And help you through lean times. If you will. <laughs> Some of you might think, Pastor, why are you ruining a good thing? <laughs> Give us sweet, tasty morsels. We like that. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> but not this time. Church, we need to know <laughs> the truth of God's word. We need a hearty dose of God's word today. Um, for when tough times come, and they will, <laughs> they will come. I don't want you to turn away from the Lord and think you were misled. We're all blessed, aren't we? We would say that we were. We have adequate food. We have adequate shelter. Uh, we have extra things like toys or maybe some money in the bank, right? Those kind of things, hopefully, right? Um, perhaps... Uh, You've been blessed with a job, <laughs> right? The strength to do it, that's all from the Lord, right? Maybe you're happy and healthy today, and you would say, oh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, right? But we all know that life isn't always like that, is it? It's not. <laughs> Living life, we journey through many valleys, the low spots in life, the tough spots in life, we all travel through them. Some of you are like, uh, I've been there and I've done that, <laughs> right? We talk about the valley of the shadow of death from Psalms 23. Some of you think you've been camping out there in the valley of the shadow of death. We've been there. We've all been there in those shadow parts, in the low spots of life. And sometimes it's there that we need to be reminded that God is on our side, that God has a plan and a purpose for each and everything that we go through. Whether it's things in the past, things present, things yet to come, we know we will. Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. Some of us have sustained unspeakable tragedies like that family in Ellenville this week. Unrelenting pain that doesn't quit. Great obstacles in life. You've had them. And during those times, it's challenging to call ourselves blessed. Blessed. It's challenging. Why is that? Because I think in America we have this mindset that to be blessed, it's very similar to that of the Pharisees in the first century. Their theory, their theology was if we behave right, God has to bless us. And we tend to think like that too. If I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, if I'm doing the right things, why aren't I blessed? Why has trouble come knocking on my door? Why did it find me again? <laughs> in, the, in the early um, 2000s, the book, The Prayer of Jabez, <laughs> was like a bestseller. <laughs> it was a bestseller. You remember it? I read it. <laughs> yeah, Jabez is First Chronicles 4.10. There's like one verse on him, maybe two. And it says, Jabez called upon the God of Israel, saying, 
Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm so that it might not bring me pain. And God granted what he asked. <laughs> Christians around the world, and especially here in America, we grabbed that book, we ate it up. Bless me, bless me, keep me from pain. <laughs> And there is a place for that, don't get me wrong, there's a place for that within the church. However, I wonder if it hasn't weakened us in that we only expect God to bless us and don't expect him to equip us. And we are equipped in the hard times of life. Does God bless us? He certainly does. We're here today, and that's a testimony that he's blessing us, right? But honestly, sometimes he blesses us with difficulties for our good and his glory. So many church, Pew Research, if you would like to call it that, has studied why um, the early the late teens into the early 30s, why they've left the church, why they no longer believe in God. They would say he's not relevant to them, he's not relevant to their world, and I honestly believe we've lost them because we have taught them that God is a God of blessing only. And that's just not the truth, is it? It's not the truth. When they hit difficult times, like we all do, God didn't seem to come through as they wanted him to come through. He didn't answer the way that they asked him to. So poof, their faith was gone. The church continues to struggle, I believe, because of our wrong mindset that if we do what's right god is he has to bless us that's wrong because you see that in the script we see in the scriptures opposite of that people are praying for revival and so we should we should pray for a move of god some people are saying give us the 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 holy spirit pour it on on us like it was on that early church in the book of acts and you see the miracles there, and you see the power poured out. I mean, prison doors were shaken open, right? Um, the dead were raised to life by a handkerchief. You know, I mean, like, you see over and over the good, the miracles that happened in the book of Acts. What we fail to see is that how many of them were martyred, how many of them were persecuted for their faith, because there is something valuable that happens in hard times. We're going to talk today about choosing the painful will of God. As we come to this portion in Scripture, we're going to see our Lord in this valley. That is, he knows what is coming. We're going to talk about that painful will of God that Christ had to choose. Jesus is entering Passion Week right here in chapter 12. Pastor, there's still chapters left. <laughs> John covers it in more detail than the other Gospels. But we see here that Jesus accepts the painful will of God for his life. He had a choice. <laughs> he had every amount of free will that we do. <laughs> he did. He could have said, scourging, beating, crucifixion, no thanks. <laughs> I'll find another way. But he chose to do it God's way. The painful will of God, we see Jesus chose. Sometimes the road that God is leading us on is painful. It involves pain. But it's a biblical truth we see throughout the scripture. You can't read the Bible and say to yourself that God always blessed his children you see the suffering there. You see, 
But God has a purpose in it all. He has a purpose in there. The people who've gone before us, you cannot miss how they see that God led them through painful times. God taught them. He instructed them. He prepared them in painful times. If we only have this idea that God is here to bless us, bless me, bless me, Lord, bless us for and no more, <laughs> then we've got the wrong attitude and we won't have the roots that are needed to sustain us in a drought, in the hard times in life. We have to choose to hold God's hand no matter what path he chooses for us. We have to hold on to his hand no matter the path that he chooses for us. In those seasons, you have a choice. You can hold on to God or you can split. <laughs> you can leave your faith there and just go on, right? You can take an easy way. The enemy of our soul always provides an easy way. <laughs> well, you could do this. You can get out of here, right? But remember what Jesus said about the easy route in Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. In our text today in John chapter 12, we're going to pick up where we left off in verse 23. It says this, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in dark in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and we ask for your Holy Spirit's help to bring the word of God to our hearts. Father, I pray that you would gird us up in our most holy faith. Father, that you would gird us up with your precious Holy Spirit. Father, that we would begin to grow roots down, roots of faith to hold strongly to you. That we would be very sure that our anchor is holding in times, Lord, that are ahead 
and times that we're living in today. Father, that you would hold us and keep us, that we would stay true to you on the mountaintops and in the valleys low, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I believe there's a few principles in the word that will help us in choosing the painful will of God. First of all, I think that Jesus never just throws us into the deep end of the pool before we know how to swim. <laughs> I think he leads thus gently. I believe that. He does. Until he grows us and strengthens us. Right? That's what I believe, first of all. But I think there's a preparation there that takes place. We see it in verse 23 and 24. If we look there again, it says, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified very truly. I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. When I look out at you today, I know you. <laughs> I know the struggles you've had. You've shared them with me, many of you. I know the pain, the sorrow that you've been, the tough things that you've been through. I know the divorces that you've had. I know how your, how your heart has braked as your children have walked away from the Lord. Some of you have had a child pass on to eternity before you. We've suffered loss of spouse. We've suffered many things. As I look around the room, and some have suffered from sinful choices that we have made, and some of us have walked in very dark times, struggled with depression or darkness, right? But if we would look back at our lives, honestly, many of us would say, I don't ever want to go through that again. <laughs> right? Sometimes we think of ourselves and we think, oh, but I've really messed up. <laughs> I left God, I doubted God, I did this, I did that. Things that we don't want to remember what we did, much less we don't want God to remember them. <laughs> And we don't want the enemy of our soul either to be able to have what he needs to accuse us, to remind us of what we've done, to use it against us, if you will. But there's some truths in the Bible on how God uses our lives to shape us into the person he wants us to be. We're too quick in making something and it doesn't turn out how we want. We just scrap it. Our God does not scrap us. Amen. <laughs> he does not scrap us. He sees the value in us. And he can use it for his glory. How could God use it when it's such a big mess? When I've made it such a mess, how can he use it? All our ugliness, we've all got an ugly past. <laughs> Something in our past that we're ashamed of. But what does the Bible say about creation? <laughs> in Genesis 2, 7, it says this. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. <laughs> so we're nothing but dirt. <laughs> we're dirt wrapped around the spirit a living spirit right that will live on in eternity one place or the other right god later in ecclesiastes 12 7 he says the dust and the dust which is our bodies returns to the ground from what from it ground it came from, excuse me, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So if God is going to use us, he's already working with dirt. So all the mess-ups that we've done, he can take them and he can use them. 
Amen? Turn our terror <laughs> into a testimony. Amen? He can. If God can take that dirt and make it walk and talk and live <laughs> and do nice things sometimes, right? He can take whatever sin, whatever addiction, whatever challenge, whatever mess up that we've had in the past and use it for his glory. Amen? That's a wonderful news, right? What is, doesn't the Bible tell us in Romans 8, 28? I hope you know it by heart, right? And, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All things. Not just the good things, <laughs> but all things, right? So some of you might look back upon your past or your present and ask God why. Why? What's up with that pain, God? <laughs> What's up with that? That hurt. That about did me in, God. <laughs> he works in us. He works in us for our good and his glory, right? Right? Because when we make it through, he gets the glory, right? He gets the glory. I believe a big part, we stress it in uh, grief share, is that we can comfort one another with the comfort we have found. Some of you have gone through such tragedy in your life, such pain and such suffering, but you're here today as a testimony. And when we look around and we see others hurting the same way we were hurting, we have within us <laughs> the experience and the blessing of God that we can help them, comfort them with the comfort we've received ourselves. That's what Paul talks about in Corinthians. We're quick to say, why, why did you take that one from me? Why, why did I have to live through such rejection? What is the struggle I'm going through? <laughs> Some of us that could say, I fasted, I prayed, and the answer didn't come. Where were you, God? God is using it all to prepare us. To prepare us. Your father is the master potter. Remember when we had the potter man come? <laughs> the journey to the potter house? He is working in us. He's taking it all <laughs> and using it for his glory. He will shape you into the masterpiece he has in mind for you. And it will be for your good and his glory. In all things, he works for the good of those who love him. So there's good news today. <laughs> there's good news that God has made a way for us. This time that we're going in, we see these things happening. Everybody seems to know something is going on. <laughs> Ralph says it many times. He's coming and he's upset. <laughs> he's coming. Our Lord is coming back. I believe this age that we're in is going to culminate in the Lord's return. It sure seems like it, right? Jesus said we know the times and the seasons, and we know it's getting to be that season. How long will he tarry? We don't know. How long will he wait? We don't know. But he is doing a work in us, preparing us for those days, right? Preparing us. In Matthew 25, Jesus describes the last days what they will look like, and the reason that he's delaying. And that reason is preparation. <laughs> preparation of his church, I believe, right? It's bridal preparation time. Jesus talks about the groom coming for his bride, the church, right? And so we must be getting prepared. Joyce and Brian are celebrating a year married today, right? They were married a year ago today. Things are a lot different now than they were then, right, Brian? It was all about the wedding. I've heard many engaged couples say, after we got engaged, it was all about the wedding, <laughs> right? 
And it was all about being ready for that day. Did Joan have the music? Was the photographer set up? Did the, the guys have matching ties? Blah, 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 blah. A lot of preparation Joyce had to go through too. Getting the dress and on and on and on. A lot of details with busy minds and thoughts, right? <laughs> but we have to understand the Bible in context and who it was to and who it was written by, right? We have to know that the culture of the time. And Jesus talks about this preparation. In Jesus' time, when the man asked the woman to marry him, there would be an engagement party. party a big shindig, all right? <laughs> After that, the groom would leave for an extended time because he had to go and prepare a place. He had to go prepare a place, a home for his bride to live with him, right? And so he would go and prepare, and however long it took, whatever kind of carpenter he was, I don't know, it would take time. Maybe it was a stonemason. I don't know. But we'd go and work on that. And then the bride's father would have to go and inspect the house. Is it worthy of my daughter to live here? Can my, am I, is this what my daughter's accustomed to? Right? <laughs> right? Is that what she's, she needs? Oh, she needs this and that, right? Our daughters are pampered, aren't they? They're a little spoiled. But, yeah, so the father would go and prepare. And when the father said it was okay, then the groom could go, right? The father would go back, and then the bride would know it's coming soon. It's coming soon. My Prince Charming is coming soon to get me because it's ready, all right? And so she, then they would be the last hurry to get everything done. She would get a clue that he was coming, right? He was coming. Our Heavenly Father <laughs> is watching to see that it's prepared for us. And we need to be preparing here because he's coming soon. Our part is to recognize the times that we're living in and make ourselves ready. Well, the groom is away. He's preparing a place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there, you may be also. <laughs> but the bride had to put herself through different treatments so she would be a radiant bride for her groom. Choosing the painfulness of getting ready. If you've ever had your nails done or your hair done, I'm telling you, it could be painful. <laughs> no matter how good they are and how great you look afterwards, there's some pain involved, <laughs> right? And we won't even talk about pedicures, <laughs> right? The pain involved there. But there's a choice in preparing, making yourself ready. A bride who's made herself ready. We are the bride of Christ. The Bible specifically says that about the church of God, the bride of Christ. Revelations 19, 7 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. In all things, God is working in us. Some of your guys are like, but I'm a guy. I know that. It's a picture, right, of us being prepared for God. God is working out his purpose. That means that any pain that you experience, God is using it to try and prepare you, to purge you of fear, to purge you of doubt or any unbelief, because God wants to present you as a radiant bride, spotless, to his beloved son, Jesus, right? So there's a choice there. He tells us in verse 27 and 28, now my soul is troubled, Jesus is speaking. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very hour that I came. Father, glorify your name. 
This hour has come for a reason. And he's not going to draw back, right? He's going to do the Father's will, even though it's painful. Some of us would say, Pastor, I didn't choose this time to be born, and I'm not crazy about what's going to happen. <laughs> Why me? Why am I here? I don't know if I can do it. We don't get to choose the time we were born in. We don't. But you've been chosen to be here in this time. <laughs> and God won't just throw us in the deep end. He wants us to be prepared. To be prepared. Now in our, our modern church, <laughs> we, we're facing crisis. We see that the more we try to fit in, the more we realize we can't. And we've tried to fit in so long that um, we're struggling to stand for what is true. The stakes are getting higher all the time. We do not know what lies ahead. We know that persecution around the world is at an all-time high for believers in Jesus. There are more martyrs today than there was in, that we see in the scriptures. We don't know how close that will come to us, but we need to be sure we're prepared to do whatever is called upon and to not lose our faith in the Lord Jesus. There definitely will be times when we'll be forced to choose between right or wrong. Will we compromise or will we do the painful will of God, whatever that may be? I don't say that to frighten you, church. I don't. I don't want to frighten you. God is coming for those who are looking for his appearing, the scripture says. But to prepare you. To be honest before you, um, to let you know that your suffering in the past, your suffering today, your suffering that is yet to come is all for a purpose to prepare. And you have a choice, just as Jesus had a choice. Am I going to choose this way? Am I going to stick with God, hold on to that unchanging hand? Or am I going to give up? Because he could have said no, just as we could say no. But Jesus said, yes, I'm going to do the will of God my Father. We see a death of self. In verse 24, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates his, their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Jesus is talking to the crowd, and they understand farming. They know if they leave their seed in the barn, nothing's going to happen. But if they put it in the ground, <laughs> did you ever do that thing in school where you put the bean in the cup and you see it split open and it looks dead and it's all like ruined now, but it's out of that brokenness, that new life comes, right? And it sprouts forth, that bean, remember <laughs> how it grows? Yeah. Jesus is talking to the farmers and they understood the only way that God can get the most benefit, the most glory out of us <laughs> is when we choose to die to ourselves. Die to ourselves. Does that come easy? No. Is that natural? Not at all. <laughs> right? We die to ourselves. How do we do that? We, by, oh, preferring one another. <laughs> by not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Right? There's a big difference with how people um, prepare themselves for weddings now. <laughs> Someone might come and do your makeup. Oh, you got a little flaw here. Let me take care of that. You got this. We, don't worry. We'll make you look good. <laughs> right? Don't worry. We'll cut your hair right. Don't worry. We'll fix it. We just put stuff on. That's what we do. <laughs> Billy Graham said if the barn needs painting, paint it about makeup, right? <laughs> That's what he said. Um, 
total different in the Bible. In Bible days, that culture was completely different. Instead of putting stuff on, they would strip. <laughs> oh, you have a dark spot here? We'll just take that off. <laughs> but the, there was beauty treatments, and they would take, look at the book of Esther. She went under the, the year of, of fragrances, a year of this, a year. There were years preparation to prepare her to get down to the beauty that was there. We put it on and cover it up. <laughs> That's not how God works. <laughs> he wants to get down to what's there and show the beauty that he put there. Choosing the painful will of God does this. It strips away our imperfections. There's nothing like grief or loss or difficulties to show some faults within us. We get short in difficult times, don't we? We get grumpy. We get downright nasty in difficult times. Why is that? We try and excuse one another, but what that difficulties are showing what's there. <laughs> that didn't just show up, <laughs> right? It's what's there in us, and those difficulties bring them to the surface. Right? You hit your, your thumb with a hammer. <laughs> what's in there? What's going to come out? <laughs> right? Somebody hurts your feelings. What comes out? You lost someone? <laughs> what comes out? Right? It's all what's in there. And you see, that's how the bridal preparation took down to what was just the bare bones, maybe. <laughs> Not literally the bones, but taking off all those things. God wants to strip us of all those flaws. <laughs> All that is there of ourselves. <laughs> we die to self. That's the only way true growth will happen is when that kernel dies. <laughs> the reward is great. <laughs> it says, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, and anyone who hates their life in this world, will keep it for eternal life. The only way the church grows is through death. I've never seen a church split because people wanted to be like Jesus. I've never seen a church split when somebody was showing too much Christ-likeness. It's always the case that someone is holding on tightly to their own rights, to their own entitlements. I didn't get what I wanted. And then we see dissension, right? That's the complete opposite of what Jesus would have us to do. He's called us to pick up our cross, count the cost, and follow him. Jesus came to this earth with one purpose, to fulfill the will of God, the painful will of God, to die on the cross for our sins. He died so we can live. We, in turn, need to die to ourselves so that he'll be seen, so that he'll be glorified. That means sometimes pain. I'm sorry. I wish there was another way. God takes all that pain and all that suffering and it's for our good. He uses it all for his good and our good and his glory, right? He uses that for him. I want us to um, spend a, a couple minutes just in prayer reflecting ourselves. All these things in our lives, they bring out stuff that we didn't know was there. Anger we didn't know. Jealousy that we didn't see before. 
but it brings it to the surface. But God brings it to the purpose, for the surface, for the reason to rid it, to rid it, us of it, to take it away. We are the canvas and the clay. He's the one who makes us beautiful. He uses us for his glory. If you want to um, come to the altar today, I ask you to be respectful of that. Father, that you would touch us, Lord, that we would hold tightly to your hand, God, knowing that you use all things, Lord, the painful things of our lives, God, we give them to you. Help us, Lord, to walk uprightly before you through the path that you have laid out for us. Thank you for reminding us, God, today that you use it for your glory and for our good. Help us, Lord, to grow down roots in these times of difficulty. Lord, that we would lean upon you, for you are faithful and true. And you are preparing a place for us. And you're preparing us for that place. Lord, seal your word upon our hearts. Continue that good work you've begun in us. Oh, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name.